And in 1783, we had won our victory. And then another extraordinary thing about this young nation. They sent diplomats like John Jay and John Adams and Benjamin Franklin to negotiate this peace treaty with these wise British diplomats, these men who know the world, savoir faire. And they utterly hoodwinked them. We got our territory going all the way out to the Mississippi River because our diplomats were that much better than the British. The British diplomats came back home in disgrace for having made these terms. And in fact, they were so upset about it that when the painting was made, you'll notice it, uh, our diplomats are there, but there's an empty space where the British diplomats were, there, were supposed to be. They were so disgraced by this. So we gained this territory all the way out to the Mississippi to which we had only a fairly vague claim. This was in 1783, and we were governed under the Articles of Confederation, and for a lot of people, these, like Patrick Henry, the Patriots, these were the good articles that had brought about our freedom. There were about 13 sovereign republics governing themselves and coming together only to discuss common foreign affairs. But in 1786, a mortgage crisis began. Oh, no, a mortgage and credit crisis began. And it began out in western Pennsylvania, western Virginia, frontier regions of Georgia. You were a Revolutionary War soldier. You fought bravely. You would come back home to rebuild your farm. You got no government assistance in any of this, correct? You went down to a <coughs> local merchant to buy seed corn, a new plow, and a mule. And you gave him the script that they had given you your bonus money in. Continental script, continental dollars. And the merchant said, I don't take this stuff anymore. It's worthless. If I take this to my merchandiser in Worcester, he won't accept it. Because his bankers in Boston won't accept it. You've got to pay in hard currency. You don't have any hard currency. And so it began. And it went right on up through Worcester right on up to the banking houses of Boston, right on up to London and Amsterdam with a huge credit freeze, the fall of 1986. Now, Americans were different then. I, I teach about the American Revolution to my students, but they can't relate to them. They're just a different sort of person. They would not have sat by and watched their years of livelihood, diversified in all these mutual funds, <laughs> vanish. They did something about it. And what you did was say, well, wait, we did not overthrow the British just to have all of this happen to us. So in Western Massachusetts, under you, Daniel Shays, Captain, Revolutionary War hero, you took the same rifles and muskets you used to kill the British, and you were going to go kill those bankers and legislators in Boston. And to do it, you needed some cannons. And you were on your way to the armory in Springfield to get those cannons, when finally the bankers in Boston hired a militia to come out and stop you. But this was serious business. And wise heads in the country in the fall of 1786 realized something has to be done about this mortgage crisis, this financial crisis. And there were young men among them, Alexander Hamilton, James Madison. Both of them knew from their study in history that the introduction of convenient currency, money, the introduction of the first coinage led to a huge debt crisis in Greece. Same way the introduction of the credit card has played a major role in this, hasn't it? Makes it easier to go into debt. Huge debt crisis in Greece, and it led to dictatorship. They knew that in Rome, what had really propelled Caesar into power was not his conquest of Gaul, but a credit crisis and a mortgage crisis that he was able to solve in a way that satisfied both debtors and those to whom they owe the money. And they made him dictator. They weren't going to let this happen. So they began to work on getting authorization to hold a Congress, a convention to modify the Articles of Confederation to make them able to deal with a commercial crisis and to create a viable structure of Republican freedom. What did Washington come? He didn't want anything to do with it. He was sick to death of politics. Young Madison would write him all that winter, and he'd write back and say, no, I am not coming. But finally,
finally he too was persuaded by the enormity of the crisis. And they came together there in Philadelphia, 55 of them. And their first step, as they set about not to modify the Articles of Confederation, these were not people who were mediocrities bound by some little regulation. They were to create a new constitution, correct? First step was to bar the press. <laughs> it's true. No press. Now they believed in the press. They believed, as Jefferson did, that he'd rather have a, if he had to choose between a government without newspapers and newspapers without a government, he would take newspapers. But the press would have its day after they had done their work. And they took an oath that they would not divulge what was being said in those proceedings. One day, they came in and George Washington, who presided over it, stood up and said, yesterday after everyone had left, I found this set of notes. Anyone <laughs> cleaning up could have found it and distributed it. Will the gentleman who left it please come up? Nobody moved. And nobody ever left another set of notes. There was a towering figure of Washington. This man of the frontier. This best general in America's history. Don't let somebody tell you he wasn't a good general. What is the job of a general? To win a war. And he won the most difficult war, an important war in American history, because there never would have been another American war. Isn't that true if he had not won? Man of dignity and moral authority. They, were, they had many... The nurse of that's where much of the uh, business of the convention was really done, was drinking and eating. And some of these men prided themselves on being two bottle men. You drink two bottles of wine and not these little point seven five, whatever they are, but I mean a good, real, poor <laughs> wine. And there they were, there was just a man at Washington standing over the corner with his hands like this. And uh, Gouverneur Morris, a rather vibrant delegate. Only had one leg actually. He'd lost a leg jumping out of a bedroom window when a lady's <laughs> husband had come home on his <laughs> But he, he said to Hampton, he said, Look at the poor general standing up there. He's lonely. Let's go talk to him. Hampton said, The general doesn't like that. If ladies are present, he'll make small talk. Otherwise, no. Tell you what, I will go up and clap him on the back. I will call him George if you'll buy me dinner. <laughs> go on. Do it. Well, George, how are we tonight? Who crept back and said, I couldn't eat the dinner if you want. <laughs> but this towering figure of moral authority and these practical politicians like Roger Sherman, now he had been born in poverty. He was a cobbler by trade, but he rose to be a wealthy man, signed the Declaration of Independence, sit on the board of Yale College, which he never could have attended as a young person. He was the shrewd one. Conference almost came to an end over a fairly simple question. Are we going to be represented by each state having one vote, or are we going to be represented by proportion? And a big state like Virginia and New York said it's all got to be done on a proportional basis. And you're a little Delaware. Brave, noble little state is Delaware, but she said, no, we're all going to have the same vote. We're not going to change it. Roger Sherman said, look, why don't we in the House of Representatives let it be by proportion, and in the Senate be everybody has the same vote? Simple enough, but it has worked all these years, has it not? and led us through every great crisis. And then the commander-in-chief, to put all this power as commander-in-chief in one person's hand, that led to a Caesar. And every democratic revolution in history had ended in a Caesar. Then the word began to be spread. What if General Washington were to be the first president under this new constitution? Oh, that changes everything. If General Washington is president, that power will not be abused. Don't you wish you had that kind of moral authority? That a new nation would entrust itself to you? So Washington was agreed. If he became the president, they would vote for it. And so it went on down. Until in one summer, from May 25th when they really got started, to September the 17th, 1787, they had created this constitution. Now, do you think Congress is going to do that much this coming summer? 